Hello friends, my name is Lucas Mann. I'm the pastor of the Spring Church, about 15 minutes from here. And I come here to preach the gospel of grace to you, dear friends. We come here to share the message of life. Uh, my friends, the Bible says that Jesus Christ is Lord. And He reigns over the universe as the King of glory. And all things are being put in subjection under His feet. All His enemies are being brought under subjection. And so, dear friends, I come as a, as a delegate, as a, as a representative of Christ, as an ambassador for Christ, to plead with you to be reconciled to God through His Son. For there is no other way but through Jesus Christ. Acts 4.12 tells us that there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. No other name but the name of Jesus Christ. And He saves from sin. He saves from the, the effect of sin. Because we know from Scripture that the Bible says sin brings hell. Sin brings upon the sinner hellfire. And I certainly do not want you to go there. And so Christ the Savior redeems from sin and its effects. We find ourselves in a sinful world, in a fallen world. It's all around us, the effects of sin. Even our own hearts are tainted by its evil, by its perversion. And so the only solution to this great great dilemma that we have is is Jesus Christ. It's the only way. There's no other Savior. There's no other Lord but Jesus Christ. There's only one true God, the God of Scripture, the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Blessed Trinity. And it is this triune God that saves and works in perfect unity to bring about salvation for the people of God. Jesus Himself said in John 10 that He is the Good Shepherd and He lays His life down for the sheep. Truly He is. He did lay His life down for His people, for His sheep at the cross. And that's what I embark this afternoon to proclaim unto you, to bring to you, is the message of life but also to warn you about the rejection of Christ, the, the continued hardness of heart that some of you might have, that what that will bring you is not goodness with God, is not a right standing with God, but your resisting of His Lordship, your resisting of God's truth will only bring you punishment, will only bring you damnation. And certainly no one in their right mind would want to go to hell. I don't want you to go to hell. I don't want you to die in your sins. I care enough for you to tell you this, friends. Instead, I want you to be brought into a right standing before God. Into a right relationship before God. Sometimes preachers will say, you need to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. There's a problem with that. You already have a relationship with Jesus Christ. The question is, the question remains, what is that relationship that you have with Jesus Christ? It is either a relationship of enmity and fighting and, and, and war with God. Or it is a relationship of peace and right standing. There's only two options. Jesus said that you are either a f for me or you are against me. There's no neutrality with Jesus Christ. There's no middle ground. You're either His friend or you're His enemy. You're either the child of God or you're the child of the devil. And I hope that for those whom God's chosen, that they will become the children of God to the hearing of the gospel of Jesus Christ, perhaps even this day. And God will use perhaps even this very sermon to bring some, maybe one or many, of His chosen people to faith in His dear Son. So the text of Scripture I'd like to direct your attention to this afternoon is out of Romans chapter 2. In Romans chapter 2, and we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. And the Apostle Paul writes these words in Romans 2. He says, Therefore, you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. And clearly here the Apostle Paul in Romans 2 is addressing the religious, addressing those who had a form of religion, an outward conformity to rules and regulations, but no inward. God bless you.
no inward relationship, true peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. They only had an outward appearance that they were religious. And that is the issue I want to address this afternoon, is those who are religious. Oftentimes when I'm on the streets preaching, I'll run into people who are not religious, but because of being in the Bible Belt, and even I myself being a pastor, I run into these people all the time who are religious but lost. They say they follow Christ, but they are dead within. And I myself, I was like this for years. Eight years of my life I spent as a false convert, saying I was a follower of Jesus Christ. Yet I lived in blatant rebellion to the will of God. I li lived in blatant rebellion to the truth of Scripture. I was self-deluded. I thought, well, I asked Jesus into my heart, and therefore I'm saved, right? It's not about that. In fact, the Bible never uses that term. You would, you'd be hard-pressed to find where the Bible even says, ask Jesus in your heart. It never does. It says, repent and believe the gospel. Those are the, that's what you must do to be saved, is to repent and believe the gospel. Yet there are droves of people in churches and droves of people, especially here in the Bible Belt, in the biblical South, that have a form of religion, have a form of Christianity. And yet they have no inward reality of it. And they're lost. They're lost. That's a, scary, that's a very scary place to be in. To say you have Christianity, to say you have a, a, a relationship with God, one of peace, and you, you are the child of God, but inwardly, you are a child of the devil. It'd be better for you to just be outward and say, yeah, I'm the child of the devil, than for you to be self-deceived and self-deluded. In fact, Jesus Himself said in Matthew 7, he said these very words in verse 15. Or actually, I'll begin in verse 13. Jesus said, Entered through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name cast out demons, and in your name perform many miracles? And then listen to what Jesus said in verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. As I said a moment ago, there are many, many people who are self-deluded, who are lost, and they think they have it. They think that they have Christianity. They think that they have the true God, but in fact they have a figment of their own imagination. In fact, the, the God that many people say they believe in here in the South is actually just, a, just an imaginary God. He's more like a, a grandfather floating in the sky who just will give whatever to anybody who asks. That's not the God of Scripture. They have a false view of God. They have a false view of salvation. And they're lost. And the text there in Romans 2, as I just addressed and looked at and read off to you, addresses this issue. It addresses the religious. That they are not exempt from sin. That they are not exempt from sin's consequences. And that those who are religious are also in need of God's saving grace. See, we all agree that prostitutes murderers, gangbangers, people who are just pagan, ungodly pagans. We all agree they need saving grace. They need to be saved. But how many say that pastors, priests, and those who are in churches every week need saving grace? They need it just as much. Some of them more. They need God's saving mercy. 
All mankind is under the curse of sin. They're under the effect of the fall. No one's exempt from this. No one, it doesn't matter who you are, where you're from, how much money you make, how popular you are, what the color of your skin is, it does not matter. You're under the effect of sin. I'm under the effect of sin outside of the saving grace of Jesus Christ. We're all under its dominion and its power. And that's why Christ had to come was to save sinners from their sin. Jesus Himself said in Luke 19.10, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. And it ultimately is that Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Gospel of the Son of God, the Son of Man, that I seek to proclaim to you this afternoon. But before we do, I want to consider the context of Romans 2. The context of this passage of Scripture I just read because it gives us an understanding of what Paul is meaning here when he wrote these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He said in chapter 1, just one chapter back in verse 16, he said that I am not ashamed of the Gospel. So the rest of the book of Romans is an exposition of the Gospel. It's an explanation of what is the good news of Jesus Christ. Well, succinctly put and shortly put, it's, it's that Jesus died and was buried and was raised on the third day. And Paul beautifully and powerfully shows that in the, in the next few chapters. But before he does so, he brings to the, the reader's attention the bad news. So we know the gospel is good news. Even the Greek word euangelion, that it's exactly what it means. It means good tidings, good news. So we know that it is good news, but... What is it a remedy for? Well, it's a remedy for the bad news. See, there's bad news the Bible brings to our attention. That God is holy and just and we are sinners and we've broken His law and we deserve hell for our sin. Those truths in beautifully describe what the bad news is. That we are without hope in and of ourselves. And so that's what Paul first explains in chapter 1. He begins in verse 18 by saying, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. And then just a few verses later, ten verses down, in verse 28, Paul writes, And just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, God gave them over to a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper, being filled with all unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They are gossip, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unloving, unmerciful. And although they know the ordinance of God that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So he, he, he brings a very sweeping... Thank you, God bless you. He brings a very sweeping list of items, a list of sins that mankind has dove into and swims in and drinks down like water. That's bad. That's very, very bad news because these sins ultimately earn hell. Jesus, the, the chief evangelist, the, the, the centerpiece of all the Bible, spoke more on hell than he did about heaven. It was to warn sinners of its impending judgment, that hell is a real place. The most loving person to have ever walked the earth, the Lord Jesus Christ, out of His love for humanity, warned sinners about the wrath of God. And so firstly, that's what Paul wants to establish. He wants the sinner to understand their state. See, if a doctor went to his patients, every time a new patient came in and he said, sat him down and the first thing he told them, he said, listen, I've got good news. I've got remedy for your illness. Here you go, just take this medicine, you'll be all better. And they'll say, what? What illness? I don't have an illness. What are you talking about? No doctor does that. A skillful doctor first takes the time to explain to his patients all the illnesses, all the diseases which they are afflicted with. He takes the time to explain to them how bad their sicknesses are, perhaps could bring them even to a point of death. And then he brings to their attention the remedy, the treatment options, perhaps even the cure for their sicknesses. And so it's the same way with the Gospel message. The Gospel of Jesus Christ is the remedy 
But we must understand the illness, the disease which we are afflicted with. We must understand the bad news before we can see the good. And so that's what Paul does in chapter 1 of Romans. He lays out the sinfulness of the pagan. And then in chapter 2 of Romans, he lays out the sinfulness of the religious. And for us to really understand why Paul was doing this, we have to go back in history, to go back in time. In Paul's day, one of the, the chief religious people in his day that he encountered were the Jewish people. They practiced the religion of Judaism. They said they worshipped the God of the Bible. They said they worshipped the God of Scripture. God bless you. And so they said they worshipped the true God and they thought they were good enough to make it to heaven. They thought that they could perform well enough. In fact, the, the people that Jesus constantly encountered with and used His most harshest language with was always the Pharisees and the scribes and the religious elite because they thought that they could earn righteousness before God by their performance. They thought they could be good enough. They thought they could placate God. That they could bribe Him. And they couldn't. And... All throughout Paul's ministry and Jesus' ministry and Peter's ministry and the ministry of all the apostles, they told the Jewish people, you're not good enough. You can't earn righteousness through the law. In fact, Paul says those very things in Romans chapter 3, verse 28. He says, For we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Man is, is justified by faith. We are saved by faith alone. It's not by works. And this stood in stark contrast to what the Jewish people thought. They thought that salvation was that way. That you had to be good enough. You had to keep God's law. But as we just saw in Romans 1 and in, we're going to see here in this text, no one can keep God's law. Only Jesus Christ kept God's law. Only Jesus Christ pleased the Father. And therefore, only Jesus Christ can save from sin. And so, in its immediate context, Romans 2 is addressing the Jewish people who were reading this book in the first century. However, this applies to anyone who is religious in this day and age as well. That if you think you, by your religion and by your merits, can... Bring yourself to God. You are terribly deceived. That's why Romans 2 verse 1 begins with these words. Let us contemplate this passage and the guilt of the religious that is spoken of. So verse 1, Paul says, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment how often do we read the news or see something that disgusts us that someone else does? Whether it be that, let's say a man had raped a woman and then murdered her. Everyone, all together, as a society, we are disgusted with that. And we all say, how terrible, how evil of a man. He must be some perverted person to do that great evil. And we're right. That's a right judgment. That's a right assessment of that man's actions and his deeds. However, but what does the text read? It says, Every one of you who passes judgment, in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. See, what Paul was encountering in his day was the Jewish people had judged all the pagans and the Greeks and said, listen, they're pagan idol worshipers. They're not saved. They're surely not going to heaven. And Paul points the finger at them and says, listen, you judge these people, you do the same things. He's not condemning their act of judging necessarily, but it's the hypocrisy. It's the hypocrisy of it. In fact, Jesus Himself said in, in Matthew 7, He says, Do not judge so that you will not be judged. But the context of that verse, that chapter, Romans, uh, excuse me, uh, Matthew 7 there, is Jesus is not condemning that you cannot judge someone else. He was condemning those who were hypocrites in their judgment. And a, a good example of this would be someone, let's say... You find out that a friend of yours or a family member has cheated on their spouse, has committed adultery, and you rightly condemn that as wrong, and you judge them for that. And you're right in your assessment. However, you're also hypocritical because if you've ever looked with lust 
Jesus said in Matthew 5 that that is adultery of the heart. Or if you have ever looked upon someone and judged them for being a murderer, if you've ever considered someone as guilty for being a murderer, you're right in your judgment, but you're also hypocritical. Why? Because Jesus said in Matthew 5 that if you have anger in your heart towards someone else, then you commit murder. It's the same as murder. God sees it the same way. Dear friends, God sees the mind and He sees the heart. He sees the intentions of your heart. And regardless if, even if you're religious, He sees that you're evil and you need a Savior from your sin. And then He says, For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. Why do they condemn themselves? Because they show by their judgment of someone else that they know that that deed is wrong, yet they practice it anyways. Yet they commit that very evil themselves. So if you judge someone else for lying, or for thievery, or for adultery, or murder, and you have done those things, you've judged yourself. You've admitted that by your own actions that you know those things are wrong, yet you've done them anyways. God has given every man a conscience. Every one of us knows right from wrong. We know it is wrong to steal and to lie and to blaspheme. We know that it is wrong for one to dishonor their parents. We know that it is wrong for someone to murder someone else in cold blood. We don't have to be told that. We know that inherently. That's because God has given us that, dear friends. God has given us that knowledge of right and wrong. But listen to what he says at the end of verse 1. He says, For you who judge practice the same things. Just as I said, if you've ever judged someone from, for, for something that they've done, yet you've also done it, then you've judged yourself. And listen to what he says in verse 2. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. So now Paul points to the ultimate authority. Who is it? It's God. Who's the ultimate judge? It's God. Who's the Holy One of Israel? It's God. And Paul says that is the one to whom we will all be accountable for on the day of judgment. It is God who judges. It is God who condemns to hell. It is God who renders judgment. And so Paul says it does not matter whether you are a pagan and you're, you're completely non-religious. You're just a secularist, a humanist, an evolutionist, whatever. Or if you're religious, perhaps you even say you're a Christian. It does not matter. You're not exempt from the power and effect of sin. All of us are under sin's dominion by default. In fact, listen to what Romans 5.18 says. It says, So then as through one transgression there resulted condemnation to all men. When God put Adam and Eve in the garden, He forbade them from eating from one tree. It was in the middle of the garden. He said, You shall not eat from this tree. And what did they do? They, they rebelled against God. They disobeyed God. And so all mankind in Adam has fallen. We've all inherited this sinful nature. People are not born inherently good people. People are not born inherently... In fact, those of you who are parents, I want you to remember something. Go back to when your children were two years old. The terrible twos, as they call them. Do you remember ever having to teach your child to disobey you? Or to not clean up after themselves? Or to disrespect you? No, you didn't. That was built in them. You had to teach them how to behave and how to obey you. Mankind is born with an inherent evil. In fact, listen to what Romans 3 says in verse 10. Paul writes, quoting the Old Testament, he says, There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become useless. There is not one who does good. There is not even one. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Wow. Wow. That's, that's hopelessness right there, dear friends. 
is hopelessness. That's why Jesus Christ had to come into the world. Because this is our state before God. This is what we've inherited, friends. It's because we have fallen short. We fall short daily of the glory of God. In fact, He said those very words in Romans 3.23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What is the glory of God? What does that mean? We know what sinned means. What does it mean to fall short of the glory of God? We have to understand firstly, what is the glory of God? The glory of God is His beauty. It's who He is. It's the weightiness about God. It's what makes God God. He's glorious. All throughout the Scriptures, both Old and New Testament, the writers ascribe glory to God. They say, bring all the glory to God. For He is worthy of glory. He is glorious. See, people don't understand the nature of God inherently. People do not have a, a right understanding of who God is. We have a perverted understanding of who God is because of our sin. In fact, what we all have this bent to do is is to make up a God in our own minds that suits our desires, that suits what makes us most comfortable. That's something we all do. We have this inherent bent to be idol worshippers, to form an idol in our own minds. But Scripture stands as the testimony to the character of God. Who is God? Well, firstly, Scripture declares to us, especially the book of Leviticus, that God is holy. God is a holy God. And what it means to be holy, it means to be set apart, sanctified. God is set apart from all that is evil and perverse and wicked and corrupt. Truly, He is, he is apart from this world and the evil that lies within it. God is also a just God. God bless you, ma'am. God is also a just judge. It means he, he, he accounts for the wicked of men and He, he punishes the evildoer. That's an aspect of God's character, that He's just. Also, God is merciful. God holds back from us what we rightly deserve. What we all deserve right now is to be in hell, friends. All of us. But God is holding that back from us in His mercy. Keeping that back. God is also gracious. He shows favor to those who do not deserve His favor. God is also love, as second, uh, excuse me, as First John four eight tells us. God personifies love; He defines it in His very nature. But these attributes of God, which people oftentimes will say they believe in, the attributes of God's love and God's grace, never negate the reality of God's holiness and God's justice. They never do. They never throw aside His righteousness. All God's attributes stand in beautiful harmony with one another. God's character is not self-contradicting. No. But all His attributes are gloriously harmonious and stand in total unison with one another. It is true that God is very, very gracious, though. In fact, uh, we, we can see this in creation. We see it in our lives every day. The things that we enjoy testify to the graciousness of God. That even though we deserve His judgment, we receive His grace. But the time is running out, dear friends. God's patience toward the wicked is running out. That's another attribute of God, that He's patient. He's waiting. He's giving sinners time to flee to His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, for eternal life before it is too late. And so I implore, I beg you to, to flee to Christ for eternal life. As Acts 16.31 says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. But not only has God said in His Word that He is holy, he has put forth His law, which is a display of His holiness. God's law is, is, is there for a purpose. The Ten Commandments 
And those of you perhaps who grew up in church or, or perhaps know somewhat about the Christian faith, you will know that the Ten Commandments are very important. And they're very important because they show us something about God and they show us something about ourselves. They're not the, just these random laws God came up with. They show us something about Him. And when you understand this, the Ten Commandments become glorious. They take on a new light. God said in the Ten Commandments things like, and this is taken out of Exodus 20, God said things like in verse 7, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not leave him unpunished who takes his name in vain. He said in verse 12, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. He said in verse 13, You shall not murder. Verse 14, You shall not commit adultery. Verse 15, You shall not steal. Verse 16, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Why did God give these commands? What was the purpose? It was to show us His perfection. It's to show us His character. God's holy law shows us His holy characteristics. Why does God say that you shall not murder? Because God is not a murderous God. Why does God say you shall not commit adultery? You shouldn't cheat on your spouse. It's because God is a faithful, covenant-keeping God. Why does God say you shall not steal? Because He's not a thief. Or as verse 16 says, you shall not bear false witness. In other words, you shall not lie. Why does God tell us not to lie? Because He is not a liar. And so on and so forth. These commands stand as a testimony to the perfection of God and the, and the glorious beauty of God. Don't think so low of the Ten Commandments. So as to think of them simply as just arbitrary rules God gave up, came up with, they stand as the eternal testimony to the character, the perfection of God. God is good. That's the most terrifying truth in all the Bible, friends. The most scary truth in all of Scripture, both Old and New Testament, is that God is good. God is good. In His character, He's good. And we are not. We are not. And we have to deal with this good God, this just judge, this wrathful, holy God of glory. We've got to deal with Him. In fact, uh, the Bible tells us it is a fearful thing, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. See, one of the things the Bible, especially in the book of Psalms, calls people to do is fear God. They're, people don't have a, a, a reverence for God. See, everybody fears fire. Everybody knows you're not supposed to stick your hand in a fire. Or if they don't, they're going to learn it one time and they won't forget that lesson. And the Bible likewise declares God to be a consuming fire. We are to reverence God and we are to know that He is not to be reckoned with. And those who, who do not submit to His authority, do not submit to the, the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, will be consumed by the fierce wrath of God. But going back to God's law, going back to the Ten Commandments, we know the Ten Commandments show us God's perfection, who He is, but the Ten Commandments also show us something else. The Ten Commandments show us something about us that we ought to know. And it is our fallenness before God. See, those same laws that I just recounted a few moments ago show us that we are not good enough to make it to heaven on our own. That we cannot do anything which pleases God. For we have broken His law. We have lied, as He said we ought not. We have stolen, as He said we ought not to do. We have disobeyed, dishonored our parents. And you may say, well, the commands like the forbidding of adultery and the forbidding of murder, don't worry, I didn't do those things. Well, as I said earlier, Jesus said in Matthew 5 that if you, if you even look at a woman or look at, at someone else with lust, then you commit adultery in your heart. Or if you have anger in your heart towards someone else that is equated with murder, it's because God sees the mind and He sees the hearts, dear friends. Every last one of us. He knows our intentions. In fact, dear friends, 
If I were to ask you, if I said, listen, scientists have developed a headset that if you place it on the top of your head, the top of your cranium, that it scans your brain and it puts everything you think, every thought that you think, in HD, on an HD huge widescreen television for all your family and friends to see. And what if I told you that the scientists could record your brain doing that for two hours and then they would play it back for your family and friends for two hours. You'd be embarrassed, you'd be ashamed. You wouldn't want that to happen. Because we know the things that we think are evil and perverse. We know that our hearts are wicked. We know that about ourselves. But we either suppress that truth in our unrighteousness or we embrace that and we accept that and we seek for a Savior, Christ the Lord. And that's really the challenge for you today, dear friends. You're either going to embrace the reality of your sin and seek after the Savior, Jesus Christ, or you will continue to suppress that truth in your unrighteousness and ultimately be lost and never deal with your sin before God. In fact, listen to what the words of Hebrews 4.13 says. It says, There is no creature hidden from His sight, but all things are open and laid bare before the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. Jeremiah 17.9 tells us, The heart is more deceitful than all else and is desperately sick. Don't listen to Disney, dear friends. Don't follow your heart. Your heart is deceitful and wicked and perverse. Everything about the nature of man has been corrupt by sin. We've broken those laws. In fact, just go and ask yourself. Go look at the Ten Commandments. Do a self-quiz. Have I kept these commands as God requires of me? Well, no. No, we haven't. You haven't. The religious haven't. Even those who try... You can try as hard as you can, but guess what you always find is that you didn't do it good enough. You didn't do it perfectly. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 48, He said, Therefore you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Jesus in His Sermon on the Mount raises the bar this high and says, Okay, if you want to go to heaven by your work and by your performance and your religiosity, here you go. Here's the standard. Perfection. And if you don't make it, you're not going. Was Jesus saying that we've got to somehow attain to perfection? No, He was showing us we can't. He was showing us that there, it's an impossibility to keep God's law. In the book of Deuteronomy, the... the Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote that the Israelites would be blessed if they kept God's law and they would be cursed if they did not keep God's law. What do we find as we read through the Old Testament in the history of Israel? What do we find time and time again? The Israelites did not keep God's law. They rebelled against God. They turned from God. They hardened their hearts against the prophets and they did not listen. They didn't listen to God. And so what did God do? He would, all, he would continually, time and time again, judge them. And that's a picture of all mankind that we all break God's law. And we deserve His judgment for sin. Just as someone here in South Carolina, if they were to murder someone else, or if a man was to rape a woman, he must be punished for having broken the law. He must be judged in a tribunal here in South Carolina. That's only just that that would happen. And everyone in the state of South Carolina would be calling for such a man to be punished for his law breaking. And it is the same way with God. When we break God's law, we incur the punishment. And we bring ourselves under that. We bring ourselves under condemnation. No one is exempt from that. In fact, at the end of Romans 1, Paul says in verse 32, he says, And although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death. See, we know it. We know we're worthy of punishment for our sin.
But we ask, the question arises is, what is the punishment for sin? What is the specific punishment Scripture lays out? Well, succinctly put and concisely put, it is hell. Hell is the place of punishment for the wicked. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, spoke on hell more than He did heaven. In fact, it is His words where we can find the most data concerning hell. Listen to what Jesus said. This is one of the times that the Lord Jesus spoke on hell. In Mark 9, He said in verse 44, or excuse me, verse 43, He said, If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. For it is better for you to enter life crippled than having two hands to go into hell into the unquenchable fire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Hell is a place that Jesus described as a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you ever broken perhaps a limb or have undergone some horrible excru- excruciating amount of pain and you, you, you perhaps even wept and you gnashed your teeth together out of the pain? Well, Jesus says that is what is going on in hell every moment is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus described hell as a place of outer darkness. One time in in the state of Tennessee, I visited a cave system. They took us on a cave tour. And I was inside this cave, and it was so dark, I couldn't even see my hand in front of my face, just a few inches away. And friends, that's bright compared to hell. Hell is a place of outer darkness. It's so dark, it's darker than the darkest dark. And as we saw in this passage, he described it as a place of unquenchable fire. An unquenchable fire. It's the burning eternal flame. And friends, I come out here because I care for you and I don't want you to go there. I don't want you to die in your sins. I don't want you to perish. I don't want you to lose your soul because your soul is something that once lost, it can never be regained. Once it's gone out of your possession, you cannot get it back. And you're responsible in this life to deal with your soul, to deal with your eternity. In wisdom, friends, I care for you. I care for where you're going. Please be reconciled to God through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews says He is the mediator of the new covenant. He is the high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. No one can usurp the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. His kingdom has no end and He reigns forevermore. And so we find ourselves as mankind, as all people, likewise condemned under the tribunal of God, under the holy law of God without any hope in it of ourselves. That's the great dilemma. That's the bad news. That we are without hope. We have no righteousness that we can possibly offer up to God. In fact, as we just saw in Romans 3, there is not one who does good. There's not one. In God's eyes, we can't do anything good. How is that? What is like this, if someone here in South Carolina was convicted for murder and they told the judge he would just condemn them for that specific crime, if they told that judge that they had done enough good in their life, that they had given to charity and they had donated blood, that maybe he would forgive them and that he would be moved to forgive them. But my friends, no judge would do that In fact, the judge's reply would be, Sir, you're not being judged for that which you have done right, but for that which you have done wrong. God judges sinners based off of what they've done wrong, not what they have done right. And so we truly have no hope. No hope. You're lost and you're without hope. And I, by default, am lost and without hope. And I could stop there if Christ had not come into the world to save sinners, but He did. Jesus Christ came to save sinful people. See, that's the bad news of the Gospel. The bad news is we just contemplated that, that we are truly without any hope. 
condemned to hell and lost. But the good news of the Gospel is as John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him will not... Or for, for, excuse me. Whoever believes in Him will, will not be judged, but have eternal life. They will have life everlasting. In fact, listen to what it says in verse 17 of John 3. It says, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. That's the good news of Jesus Christ. God did not send His Son into the world to administer judgment, but to take upon Himself God's judgment against sin. When the fullness of the times came, as Galatians 4, 4 tells us, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, eternal God, came down in human flesh. He came down and took upon Himself the form of a servant. He humbled Himself and became a poor Jewish carpenter, Almighty God, there dwelling among men, Jesus the Messiah. And He came and fulfilled God's law in His perfect life. He came and lived a life of perfect submission to the will of God and to the commands of God. Even Jesus' life was not without a purpose. It came with specific purpose. Jesus said in Matthew 5, verse 17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill those commands that we broke. The ones which said, You shall not lie or steal. You shall not commit adultery. Jesus fulfilled those laws. He kept them in His perfect life. He never broke them. That's the glory of the good news. That's the, that's the greatness of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That He did not trample those commands underfoot. But He lived in submission to the will of God. In fact, in Matthew 3, the Father spoke audibly from heaven at the baptism of Jesus in verse 17 and he said this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased who can God say that concerning but his son can God say that about you or me no absolutely not instead instead Christ was the only one who was eligible for that to be said concerning him and then in His love toward His people, and in His love toward His sheep, He, he came and he, he laid down His life. He fulfilled all those prophecies of the Old Testament. He laid down His life as a ransom for many. He died on that cross as a sacrificial lamb. And even before He went to that cross, He was whipped. He was beat and spat upon. He was betrayed even by His own people. Even His disciples, those whom He had spent those three years with teaching them. Even they... They fled the scene. They were afraid for their own lives. And so they fled. And so here he was, singled out alone. And he was tried and he was found to be guilty even though he was absolutely innocent and sinless. He was treated and judged as if a sinner, though in fact he was perfect. And so then he was nailed to that cross, that Roman cross, at the place of the skull, at Golgotha, there outside of Jerusalem, some 2,000 years ago. And He died a bloody death, a, a horrible death. Those who are crucified, they die through suffocation. Because their body is stretched, their, their chest cavity is stretched in such a manner and there's so much stress on their core that they cannot breathe correctly and they eventually die, suffocate. It's a horrible way, it's a slow, painful death. It's not a quick death, it's very slow. And that is the death that Jesus died. But it's not just His physical sufferings that took place, something more happened there. And to understand what was happening, we turn to Isaiah 53. 
Listen, this was written 700 years before Jesus Christ even died. This is even before He was born. 700 years, 7 centuries. And this is what the prophet Isaiah wrote in verse 4. He says, Surely our griefs He Himself bore and our sorrows He carried, yet we ourselves esteemed Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him. And by His scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. See, Christ at the cross bore the sins of God's people. God counted his son as if he had broken the law. Jesus took ownership of the guilt of his church. He became responsible for the sins which I ought to be responsible for. My sin He took upon Himself at the cross. Listen to what it says in verse 10. But Yahweh was pleased to crush Him, putting Him to grief if He would render Himself as a guilt offering. At that cross, Christ bore the wrath of God. That's the beauty of the Gospel message. That Jesus Christ satisfied the wrath of Almighty God against sin. The Father counted Him as a liar and a thief and a blasphemer, though in fact He was perfect. You could think of it like this. He drank our hell. We deserve to go to hell for all eternity to be punished for our sin. But Christ took ownership of the sins of His people and he took their hell upon Himself. He took my hell upon Himself. And the infinite wrath of Almighty God was unleashed upon the Son and He absorbed it. He paid for it. He satisfied it. Romans 3, verse 25 says, "...whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood." What does propitiation mean? It means wrath has been absorbed. Christ absorbed the wrath of God. So He could say at that cross when He died, He could say tetelestai, that is, it is finished. He could declare from that cross, it is done, it is paid for. And truly, He did pay for the sins of His people. And after three days in that tomb, what happened? He was raised from the grave. Christ rose from the grave on the third day. The Father exalted Him. And that was a public display that the Father had received His sacrifice as a payment for our sins. No other man could do what Jesus said He would do and did it. No one, no one else. He predicted His death and His resurrection. And He fulfilled it. In fact, Jesus told His own disciples in Mark chapter 9, verse 30, or excuse me, verse 31, it says, For He was teaching His disciples and telling them, The Son of Man is to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill Him. And when He has been killed, He will rise three days later. He predicted it and He fulfilled it. And after 40 days of further ministry, after being raised from the grave, He then went up to the top of the Mount of Olives and He ascended bodily into heaven. And that's where He is seated now in heaven. At the right hand of the Father. At the right hand of Majesty on high. He reigns there as King. As Lord. In fact, uh, in the Old Testament, in the temple, the priests... There was no place for the priests to sit down in the temple. Nowhere. Their work was always continual. Day after day would they have to sacrifice various animals. Day after day would the priests have to perform service in the Jewish temple. And it was all pointing to the sacrifice that Jesus Christ would one day be. The Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. It was all pointing forward to what He would come and one day do for His people. But what's so amazing is as the book of Hebrews tells us, Jesus, the eternal high priest, the high priest forever, never to be replaced, went into heaven and sat down, something a priest was never to do. God bless you, sir. 
something a priest was never allowed to do because their work was continual. Well, Jesus Christ goes into heaven and He sits down at the right hand of God's throne in glory. And that was a display and that was a beautiful demonstration that Jesus Christ had completed the work of salvation once for all. And so the call of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the response that man is to have to the Gospel of Jesus Christ is this. As Jesus Himself said in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, the time is fulfilled, the Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the Gospel. You must repent that is, that you must change your mind about your sin and about the sin which you've been living in, whether it be your pornography, your lying, your thievery, your selfishness, trusting in your own merits to save you, trusting in your own good works to bring you to heaven. And you must turn from those things. You must change your mind about those things. That's what the word actually means in the original Greek. It means it's metanoia. It means change your thinking, change your mind. You must change your mind about those things. Turn from those things. Flee them. Let go of them. And run to the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your sin and turn to God. And that's the second thing. You're to believe. You're to, be you're to believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved from your sin. You are to believe the promise of the Gospel. You are to believe that what God said concerning His Son Jesus Christ is true. That Jesus truly did die for sin and He truly did raise Himself up from the grave on the third day. You must believe that as if it is a promise, for it is a promise. What do I mean by it is a promise? Well, here is the promise of the Gospel. If you, are, if you believe these things and you put your hope in these things, you put your trust in Jesus Christ alone, you can't trust in anything else. Yourself is not, nothing you can give to God is good enough. You must trust in Jesus Christ alone. Here is the promise of the Gospel. For those who repent and those who turn from their sin and those who believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ alone, they'll be saved from their sin. The, the, the sinner who flees their sin and believes upon Christ alone will be saved. They'll be forgiven. Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 24 that the Gospel message is, is forgiveness of sin. You can be forgiven of your sin and your rebellion against God totally as a free gift of grace because of what Jesus has done at the cross. And not only that, but for the sinner who believes upon Christ, they will be given the righteousness of Christ. They will be treated as if they lived Jesus' life. God will count them as if they fulfilled the law as He fulfilled the law. Because He counted Christ as if He, as if he broke the law. That's the exchange of the Gospel. That Christ takes my sin and I receive His righteousness as a free gift of grace. That's the promise of the Gospel. That's the beauty of the Gospel. That's the greatest deal. That Jesus takes my filth, takes my transgressions, and I get His perfect righteousness. So that when I stand before God, I'm perfect in the eyes of God because of the performance, because of the work, because of the toil and the labor of Jesus Christ which He did on my behalf and in my stead and in my place. That's the promise of eternal life. And this is not only for those who are outside of the saving grace of God who are ungodly pagans, but even for the Christian, this is glorious for the believing saint. This is for the church of Jesus Christ to bring comfort to our hearts and to bring us joy. Joy inexpressible 
and joy everlasting. For no one can take the joy that we have in the Gospel away from us. But concerning something that I would also like to address, and I read that text off quite a while ago, Matthew 7, and it is concerning those who are religious but lost. See, being a pastor and doing ministry, I see this time and time again. People say, many people say they're Christians, but they're not true Christians. They're not actually saved. They're not actually converted. I see this all over the place. People say they know the saving grace of God, that they have been born again, that they have had a religious experience, they've been converted, but they live in rebellion to the will of God. They care nothing about holiness or prayer or reading Scripture or sharing the Gospel with those who are lost. What do we say to these people? Do we say what a lot of evangelical leaders have said in the past? Well, they're just carnal Christians. They're just young babes in the faith. No. If someone says that they have been saved and yet they bear no fruit, it's because they've never been saved in the first place. And all they have is simply some false religion. If someone says they're saved but they bear no fruit, no genuine good fruit of conversion, it's because they're self-deluded and they're lost. And it doesn't matter how much of a religious experience you've had or how many tears you've cried or how many preachers have told you you're saved. It doesn't matter. It's about fruit. Do you bear fruit? Every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. That's how you know whether you're a true Christian or not. If you want to know whether you're a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, if any man is to know whether he is a genuine follower of Jesus Christ, it is whether or not they bear fruit. And specifically, good fruit. For if you bear bad fruit, then it's because the tree's bad. In fact, for many years of my life, I lived as a false convert. A self-deluded person. I thought I was saved. But I was addicted to pornography. I was a drunkard. I was perverse in my speech. I was hate-filled. I was self-deluded self-deceived and I'm so grateful that God in His mercy saved me and in His grace saved me from my sin for I did not deserve it I'll never deserve it but oh how it breaks my heart to see so many people here in the United States of America specifically in the Bible Belt say they're Christians in fact if you are one of those people I describe if you say you're a Christian but you live in rebellion to what Jesus Christ said and you don't bear any fruit, any good fruit of conversion, I want to ask you something. Stop calling yourself a Christian because it makes it hard for me and other true Christians to preach the good news of Jesus Christ to a lost and dying world. You cause people to blaspheme the name of Jesus Christ because you're a hypocrite. If you say you follow Christ and you don't live for Christ, and you don't live for the glory of Christ, and you're not obeying Christ, it's because you did not have salvation in the first place. I'm not saying salvation is by your work or by your performance. I'm not saying that at all. Salvation is a free gift of God's grace. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God. It is all of God's grace that we've been saved. However, when someone is saved by God's grace, the immediate result of that is that they will begin to bear fruit in their life. They will have a changed life. Salvation is you receiving a new nature. God described it in the Old Testament as a new heart. You get a new heart with new desires and new passions. And so for someone to say, well, I'm a Christian, I know Jesus Christ, and they're just as exactly the same as they were before, it's because they did not get a new nature, they did not get a new heart, and they were never converted, they're just self-deluded. And the Bible supports this through and through. The entire book of 1 John, I wish I had time to read it. But I'll just give you this one per portion out of 1 John chapter 2. And it reads these 
words in verse 3. It says, By this we know we have come to know Him if we keep His commandments. The one who says, I have come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His word in Him, the love of God has been truly perfected. By this we know we are in Him. The one who says He abides in Him ought Himself also to walk in the same manner as He walked. Again, salvation is not by your works, but works evidence your salvation. Works are not the cause of salvation, but the fruit, the evidence of it. So if someone says they follow Christ and they have no good works to prove it, it's because they're lost. And they need to be genuinely saved. If someone, however, says they've been saved by God's grace, they've been saved through Jesus Christ, and they bear much fruit of conversion, they've been changed, they've been given a new nature, it's because God has given them a new heart with new desires. And they've been genuinely saved. And they can have great assurance of salvation. What, are, what is all this for? Why do I come out here? Why is, the, why is the gospel even around? Why did God decide to send His Son the way He did? And why did Jesus come? What's the purpose of all this? What's the chief end? Well, simply put, it is the glory of God. It is God's glory. God is jealous for His glory. It is all for the glory of God. This whole earth, your life, everything is working to that ultimate end. The glory of God. God will bring His holy name glory even in the end of the wicked, even in the, the punishment, the eternal damnation of the wicked. And the righteous salva- the, the, the glorious salvation of the righteous. God is doing all things for His glory. And He is worthy of the glory. He is worthy of the honor and worthy of the praise that is due unto Him. In fact, listen to what the end of the book of Hebrews, Hebrews 13, verse 20 says, Now, the God of peace who brought up From the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus Christ our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do His will, working in us that which is pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. How true that is. How true that is. So I exhort you, you who are outside of Christ, to flee your sin and to trust upon the Lord Jesus Christ alone. I I plead with you to do this this day. Time is running out. Time is of the essence, friends. Whatever you are concerning yourself with this day, I want you to contemplate your eternity because today could be the day that you stand before God. 150,000 people every day die and stand before their Creator. And dear friends, I want you, if this is your day, I want you to enter into heavenly glory. I want you to be perfect in the eyes of God through the finished work of His Son. So come and have life eternally in Christ. You who are falsely converted as well, examine yourself, look at yourself, see your lack of conversion. If you claim to be a Christian, examine yourself to see whether you are in the faith. And if you're falsely converted, then turn from your sin and believe upon Christ truly. And you'll be saved from your sin. You'll be born again from above. As Jesus Himself said in John 3.3, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And lastly, for the Christians who have heard what I have said this afternoon, God bless you and go and war in the fields of the Lord, and preach the gospel to all creation unto the glory of God. Preach the gospel to a lost and dying world, and rest and find your joy in this precious gospel of Jesus Christ, and press on to further holiness to the glory of God.
So we have seen here in Romans chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, that those who are passing judgment on others are still without excuse because they practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God falls upon those who practice such evil things and such wicked things. We have seen that even if someone is religious, God bless you, thank you. We've seen that even if someone is religious, they are greatly, deeply, desperately in need of the saving grace of God, just as the pagan is. And we have seen that way of salvation brought forth. The glorious good news of the Gospel. That Jesus Christ died and rose again. And for all who believe in Him, for all of those people, they will have eternal life. And they will be brought into heaven. To the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of glory, be brought the glory, the honor, and the praise in all things forever. Amen. Amen.